What's up everybody, Unrested here after a very long sabbatical, which is like one week, that's long for me. Um, not really a lot of stress going on in my life or anything like that. Uh, actually, a bunch of good things happening all at once. I got my kids sports day, I got Halloween parties, I got a lot of commissions came in at work, and I got a brand new job started for English stuff as well. Uh, just a lot of good stuff happening, but all at once and kind of discombobulating my schedule. So I missed both of my video due dates this week. Um, I actually have... A plan for Osoroshi Saturday too. I know I keep talking about it, but um, it's finally come to my attention that um, Osoroshi Saturday is something that I have enough passion for that I need to start a separate channel for Osoroshi Saturday, mostly for the fact that, number one, it doesn't do very well on my normal JFAC channel, um, which is fine. That's okay. I'm not expecting everybody who loves JFAC to also love Osoroshi Saturday. Uh, you're not necessarily into horror just because you like Japanese things. Um, but I do really appreciate all the viewers and fans I have of Osoroshi Saturday. And honestly, it's a passion of mine, so it's something I'm going to continue on with. Um, but let's let's get on topic here. Um, this actually isn't going to be any kind of video today in which I've done a lot of research. It's mostly going to just be from my own personal experience. And it's kind of an interesting question. And kind of the opposite of the question I get the most is... Am I ready to come to Japan? Um, the opposite being, am I not ready to come to Japan? When am I not ready to come to Japan? When is it not a good idea to come to Japan? Um, and I guess really you could apply this to probably any, any international travel. Of course, there are some very esoteric and specific niche problems you may run into here. Uh, for example, um, if you have some kind of uh, mental illness that requires a large amount of um, medication, sometimes you cannot get that medication here. Uh, Japan is kind of a bit backwards when it comes to medicating as far as uh, mental illnesses are concerned. A lot of mental illnesses are either overlooked or just completely off the charts here, just not considered a real mental illness. For example, like sleepwalking doesn't exist. It's not like an actual medical, um, medically listed problem. Um, is it? I don't. I don't want to call it a disease. I don't think sleepwalking is a disease. There's, there's a bunch. There's a bunch of them. But that was just. I offhand, I know for sure of that one is one that's not listed. Um, and whatever their equivalent is to the, what do you call that book? The DSMV. I hope I got that abbreviation correct. Anyway, that's not the point. The point is, when are you not ready to come to Japan? What would be a situation in which? you would not be ready. Well, there's obviously more than one. It's not just one specific situation in which you are not ready to come to Japan. But let me go through a couple, starting first with like financial. All right, financially, um, how much do you need to come to Japan and what would not be a good amount to come to Japan with? I would say anything less, and this is, this is saying you're staying for either three months on a tourist visa or attempting to start up a life here, okay? Um, probably a tourist visa you could get away with a lot less. Maybe you could get here a thousand five hundred, a thousand, and I'm not including the plane ticket with that. Please, that's totally not included with how much money you should be bringing. Um, but if you are going to try and come here to set up a life, I would say at least two thousand dollars. Now, of course, I have had friends who have come here with far, far less. I've had friends who've come here with as little as two hundred dollars, which, you know, they really gambari mashta. You know, they they did their best and really busted their ass. They you know, the second they hit the ground on the plane, they just started running around looking for a job, and they found one, like, the first week they were there. But, I mean, you better be pretty confident in your job uh, skills. You better be pretty confident in your interview skills. Um, you better already have some kind of background with any sort of teaching or maybe, like, already have a job set up. If you already have a job set up, then you're doing pretty good, but I would still recommend at least $2,000 because you don't know when you're going to get that first paycheck and you don't even know yet if you really like the job. Um, so financially, if you are not at least up to 2000 I would at least have a great contingency plan if things do not go well, okay? Um, so that's, that's one reason when you would not be ready to come here is if you did not have enough money saved up. <sighs> Number two, I want to say maturity. Now I'm by far not the most mature person to be talking about maturity. This is, um, you know, the pot calling the kettle black. Um, but there 
is a certain sense of survival skills that you need to have, um, a bit of street smarts that you need to have. Um, do you know how to completely survive with no safety net? And by no safety net, I mean if you were dead broke and you could not reach your parents or friends or family or anyone for money, could you continue to survive? Would you have a freak out? Would you, I don't know, run to the police, immigration or something? If that's you, if you don't have any kind of contingency plan, if you can say, if I was dropped off in Japan with zero everything, I would be okay, then maybe Japan's not for you. Because when you get here, many times I've seen people have to head back home very quickly because either number one, they don't manage money correctly, Number two, they can't handle the culture shock, which really, I mean, if you're kind of a travel type person anyway, you're probably fine. But if this is one of your first trips ever, I've heard horror stories. I remember, just to go off on a tangent very quickly, uh, an example of this happening, because some people are going to be like, I don't think anybody would freak out that bad, Scott. And that's exactly how they would say it. Um, I had a friend who did JET, the JET program, and he came over with a couple other teachers at the same time. I don't know if it still works like this. Um, and he said he and the other people assimilated pretty well into the culture, figured out stuff, started to learn the language pretty fast. But there was one girl that she was freaked out already when she got to the airport. People were staring at her, which is pretty common. I mean, I still get stared at today. I'm gaijin. Um, and that freaked her out, uh, which, you know, I mean, I'm not saying she's a weak person for this. I'm not saying this is her problem. Um, it is something maybe you should have researched a little bit because it is commonly talked about in Japan that gaijin do get stared at. Um, freaked her out. She got to her apartment, apparently, like, on her way to her first entrance into her apartment, as in going there for the first time, setting up her stuff, unpacking for when she first got there. She was approached by, like, a Japanese salary man on the way who was like, how how much how much are you because oftentimes this is sad but true and you've probably even seen this in wolverine samurai um salarymen drunk salarymen have walked up to blonde women before and think that they're a russian prostitute or something like that and attempt to ask them how much they cost as a prostitute and yes sad but true very sexist fact about japan um you know i got to tell it how it is i'm not gonna sugarcoat anything that's my channel and this freaked her out, understandably so. I think that would be pretty freaky if you had never been approached in that manner. I mean, imagine you come from a very conservative um, part of America and your first time over here, you're asked if you're a prostitute. That's a bit extreme. But this, this freaked her out to no end, of course. Um, she could not handle this at all. She apparently at that point took all her furniture in the room, uh, barred it up against the doors, um, and didn't come to work on her first day. Um, of course... The jet program people, the staff, got really worried. They came to her and she shouted at them that she wasn't leaving until they bought her a return ticket and she saw it pushed under her door and that's what they had to do. They had to literally go out, buy her return ticket, which jet already pays for. They'll pay for your return ticket. Jet takes really good care of you. Um, and they went and bought it and they pushed it under her door and then she immediately asked them to escort her to the airport and she flew right back home. She never saw anything in Japan aside from, I guess, her apartment and the walk to her apartment. Um, and that was somebody who was not ready. She was not adjusted. She had not done any research. And I think that kind of just jumps us right into the next fact. Have you not done any research? If you haven't done any research, it's probably not time to go traveling yet. You should do a decent amount of research for any place that you're going to go. Uh, for long term, at least three months or more, you need to research. And I want you to research beyond just a couple websites because oftentimes what you're going to find is a lot of those websites are obsolete, they're out of date, the stuff that they're talking about is no longer true, okay? No one's going to run up to you in Japan and ask you to sign an autograph because they think you're a movie star like happened back in the 1980s when anyone with blue eyes or blonde hair showed up to Japan and were super, super rare. That doesn't happen anymore. Gaijin in Japan is not super rare. Tokyo is very international. Osaka, where I live, is very international. Um, web, there's still websites out there that say that. They'll be like, get ready to have people ask you to sign your name. I mean, I, okay, so sometimes little kids ask me to do that when I work at schools because they literally want to see how fast you can do cursive or sign your name. Because for them, imagine the same as if you watched a Japanese person do a very beautiful kanji very quickly. You'd be like, wow, I can't believe you can do the strokes all fast. I'm just learning kanji and it takes me hours to do the strokes in the right order in the right way. It, same thing, just reversed in the sense of you doing your signature in cursive. So, uh, 
I think that's another one that you really need to be careful of. Um, make make sure you just research the hell out of it. I mean, you know, go far beyond my stupid channel. Um, I I love doing this channel. It's fun. But always remember that I am listed under entertainment. I am not listed under education. Um, I highly recommend, you know, you get up-to-date books. Check to see if the person who wrote the book is Japanese. That helps out a lot. Um, oftentimes there is just a couple gaijin salarymen who come over here for like a week or something and decide they're experts on Japan and write a book. I've I found one. There's one book called like Survival Japanese, I believe. And that guy, I, it seems like he must have only spent like a week or two here in Japan and decided he was like a Japanophile. Uh, which, you know, I mean, anyone who likes or has interest or is having fun and enjoying being educated about Japan, I suppose, is a Japanophile. But at no point would I ever, even myself, after living here nine years, call myself an expert on Japan or have any kind of certification that I think makes me a professor of the Japanese culture. Oh. Okay, so get get multiple sources is my big, my big pointer on research. Um... <clears throat> If you are a person who is easily controlled by food, and people might think, what the heck are you talking about? I actually touch on this topic quite a few times in multiple videos. Many people come here and are surprised by the lack of variety. They're like, where's all my Western food? Well, it's back in the West, where you left it. Um, this is the East. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, yeah, it, there's a lot of variations in the Japanese and the Asian foods that are here. There's not a lot of variations in the Western foods that are here. They are in import, just like there's not a lot of variations in the different types of ramen or curry or gyoza that you can get back in America. Okay, same thing. If you came here and are really surprised by that, it shows me you did little to no research. The people who probably anger me the most that come here and complain are the ones who come here expecting it just to be an Asian version of their country. Like, I just thought it would be like America, but with Asian people, more Asian people. It's just like, wow, really? Do you understand how narrow-minded that sounds? Like, you're really surprised that they don't have 40 different cereals in the cereal aisle, and you're pissed off because they don't have Captain Crunch, or that they actually have laws that restrict some of the foods that come in here because their food laws are stricter. For example, they want free-range chickens. They don't want a million different food colorings in their food that are made from different chemicals that you can't even pronounce the names from. That's not something that's common in Japan. They actually try to use natural sources for a lot of their dyes. For example, they'll use charcoal for black or they'll use squid ink for black. Whereas in America, the new black Burger King burger is coming out and they're using some kind of like synthetic dye that has some kind of gigantic name for it, like Zexerbajibalon. And you're like, okay, what is that? I don't know. In Japan, not common that that's going to happen, okay? So, that's another thing. If food is your big issue, maybe Japan isn't for you. Maybe you're not ready to come. Maybe it's time for you to get really used to some Asian food before you get over here. So, four quick points I hit on there. Financial, safety net, research, food. If you can think of more, please let me know. I would be happy to talk about them. Things that you think might worry you about coming over here. I think one other thing people write to me about, which I always find kind of odd, is should I be afraid that I'm going to die in a natural disaster? Um, don't get me wrong, 2011, the March earthquake in Tohoku was, was brutal. It was horrible. Um, but that was also four years ago, and since then we haven't had a quake anywhere significant to that. Um, I mean, before that quake, I mean, the biggest one was probably Kobe. And that was, I think, 1998. So, you know, it's it's not an everyday occurrence that the Earth is constantly trying to swallow you up here. Um, and really, natural disasters are something I would list under shogunai. And the word shogunai in Japanese literally means nothing can be done, okay? If I stayed in Florida, there was a possibility I could be killed by a hurricane, um, you know, does it mean I shouldn't have ever lived in Florida because the possibility of hurricanes? I mean, that's something I have no control over. If there's elements of life that you have no control of, such as nature, then I don't really see a point in worrying about them. Um, you know, if you decide to live on top of a volcano where it might erupt any second, I can see the stupidity in that. But if you're talking about a giant landmass in which, you know, randomly parts open up, 
so be it. Randomly, different parts of all over the world are hit by some sort of natural disaster, whether it be a landslide, an earthquake, a tornado, a hurricane, a typhoon, etc., etc., until we have some sort of technological program that controls that, I don't see why we should live our lives worrying about it. Until next time, I am unrested with the questions you requested. This is JFAG, Japan's Frequently Asked Questions. Have a good one.